In the Commonwealth, coursers have a fearsome reputation. Railroad agents flee at the sight of a courser. Few meet a courser and live to tell the tale. But how did they develop that reputation? After all, aren't coursers just synths? But if so, they don't really look or act like Gen 3 synths. They dress differently. They have their own uniforms. They're extremely proficient in combat. They even talk differently than synths. They sound more like Gen 2 synths than Gen 3 synths. What is it about a coarser synth that makes it special? How are coursers made? What sets them apart from other synths? The first time we meet a courser is at Green Tech Genetics. Upon arrival, we see evidence of a huge fight, and we find the bodies of gunners everywhere. As we advance through the building, we hear gunners shouting orders at each other and warning that they're under attack from a courser. The courser's on the second floor. Kill on sight. Send reinforcements to the lobby in case there are more. When we finally meet that courser, he proves to be a difficult fight. I'm here to kill you and take what's inside your head. That you cannot have. Of course, Virgil warned us about how difficult this guy was when he sent us to Green Tech Genetics, and he's the first one to tell us what a courser is. Have you ever seen an institute courser? A courser? What's that? Another institute secret. Coursers are institute synths designed for one purpose. They're hunters. Operations go wrong, a synth goes missing and a courser is dispatched. They're very good at what they do, and you're going to have to kill one. Is that even possible? They're not invincible, so technically it's possible. Whether you are capable of it, I guess we'll find out. Upon arrival at the Institute, we get their definition of a courser from Justin Io. Our main instrument is the courser a third-generation synth assigned to operate on the surface. Coursers hunt down and reclaim synths that have escaped the Institute. They are highly self-sufficient, trained in combat, infiltration, and tracking. In a word, our coursers are relentless. You mentioned that coursers undergo special training. Tell me more about it. The SRB constantly monitors our Gen 3 synth population, looking for specific traits. Those who show tenacity, Fearlessness and independence undergo a rigorous training regimen. We teach them armed and unarmed combat, investigative techniques, psychology, and mechanical skills. Those who pass a final evaluation become coursers. The rest have their memories wiped and return to their former duties. He gives us the impression that coursers are regular synths chosen from the general population of synths for their exceptional natural abilities. Things outside of the Institute's control, things they didn't program into the synth, things that are just characteristic in each individual synth. However, we get rather conflicting information from Justin Io when we talk about killing the synth at Green Tech Genetics. I'd very much like to know how you defeated it. Why does it matter? If there is some defect in coarser combat programming, then it must be identified and corrected. I hate to break it to you. But your courser wasn't all that tough. Hmm. Then it's likely the unit was defective. It's rare, but faults can occur from time to time. I'm no stranger to combat. Even so, a courser should be more than a match for any single combatant. I suppose I'll have to ask robotics to perform detailed diagnostics on the entire production run. Here he gives us the impression that there's a particular set of programming designated just for coursers. He's trying to imply here that our success at Green Tech Genetics was not due to how exceptional we were. No, it must have been due to some faulty programming, a bug in the script. I get the impression that at this point in the story, Justin Io was feeling a little insecure and defensive. The sole survivor, Nate, here was a bit of an unknown quantity. He didn't want to look bad. Maybe he tried to give Nate the impression that his success at Green Tech Genetics was due to faulty code as a way to save face. I think his original definition of a courser is more accurate, and it certainly coincides with what we see about coursers in the actual game. Coursers are just synths, albeit highly trained synths. One might even say indoctrinated synths. A unique characteristic of every courser is the way they speak. 
Z247 at Green Tech Genetics. If you're not here for the synth, then you're here for me. What do you want? Speaks in a similar way to X418, whom we meet at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Your attempt at humor is wasted. Who has a very similar way of speaking as X688, who helps us at Libertalia. Yes, sir. Designation X688. I've already neutralized the perimeter guard. Just give the word and we can start the assault on the main flotilla. And X6 speaks exactly the same way as X927, whom the railroad meets during Operation Ticonderoga. Intelligence indicated this is a railroad base. Perimeter breached and all hostiles eliminated. Currently maintaining surveillance. However, there are two coursers in the game who do not speak this way. The first is Chase at Acadia. So, what's your story? I used to be a courser, returning synths that had escaped from the Institute. I was tracking a synth and instead found Dima. He convinced me of the truth and the error of my ways. Chase is an escaped courser. Very rare. The only one we find in Fallout 4 and, incidentally, the only female courser that we know of. In this conversation, she has moments of rising inflection. She even pauses or hesitates in order to collect her thoughts before proceeding. The other is A321, a.k.a. Harkness. My God, I, I remember. I remember it all from before. Zimmer, the Commonwealth, the Institute. My God, all those runners I brought down. We meet Harkness during the events of Fallout 3. We find him at Rivet City. I cover his entire story in my video, The Replicated Man, that you can watch here. In short, he doesn't know that he's a synth. But during the quest, we uncover information that not only is he an escaped synth, but he's a former courser. Something we learn from none other than Zimmer. The duty of this particular unit was the hunting and capturing of other escaped androids. Yes, others have escaped. It's one of the side effects of having such an advanced AI. Zimmer is the director of the SRB, the Synth Retention Bureau. Justin Io is only in charge when Nate arrives to the Institute during the events of Fallout 4 because Zimmer is on a mission. If you're the acting head of the SRB, who are you filling in for? Dr. Zimmer holds that position. He's supervising the retrieval of some of the more high-profile units. In his absence, I keep things running smoothly. Zimmer is working to collect high-profile units, and there is no synth that has a higher profile than an escaped courser. It still seems strange that the Institute would send the director of the SRB to the Capital Wasteland to find an escaped courser instead of other coursers, but this was 10 years ago, and perhaps they just didn't have very many coursers at their disposal at that time. This particular android, designation A321, is uh, different, special, the most advanced synthetic humanoid I've ever developed. The others, like my escort Armitage there, are all older models, easily replicated. Ah, but A321? It will take years to recreate him. At any rate, neither Harkness nor Chase speak like a courser. Why is that? After all, they're all synths. They're robots, created by the Institute, programmed by the Institute. You'd think that if their characters, personalities, method of speech was programmed by the Institute, it would be consistent from unit to unit, which is what we mostly see, but not completely. Welcome to the Institute, sir. You know the protocol, sir. Authorized personnel only. Unit X688 speaks highly of your combat skills. Be on the lookout for unusual synth behavior. I think this monotone way that the coursers speak is extremely important. And I think it tells us a lot about coursers, but more importantly, about the true nature of synths. I don't think this coarser way of speaking is programmed into them. Instead, I think it's culturally adopted. This is something we do in our own world. After all, why is it that preachers all sound the same? 
He said, I'm saved and baptized with the Holy Spirit. Glory to God. He's the Lord who's there. He's always present. He will never leave you. You've got to step out of your diseases. Step out of your sickness. Say no more to disease. No more to pain. No more to misery. I'm coming, Jesus. I'm coming. Why is it that salespeople kind of all sound the same? Introducing the ultimate jar opener. The ultimate jar opener does the work so you don't have to. Introducing the flip top, the perfect couch companion. The flip top's designed to hold drinks, remote controls, and more so you never have to move an inch. I need that. This hose is great. You just turn on the water and the pocket hose grows and grows and grows into a full length hose. I love watching that. Why is it that classical music radio hosts all sound the same? We'll start with the ensemble composed of soprani and alti with a piece of music written by a native of Alexandria, Virginia, who's still getting her PhD, Brittany Boykin. This prelude and fugue is an excellent example of a transcription for the accordion. Music originally written for another instrument, in this case, the organ. Let's begin with music, and specifically a series of mazurkas by Szymanowski. It's because each of these people are not only trying to convey information with the words that they're using, but they're conveying additional information with the way they say their words. The preacher is trying to convey the notion that he has authority and that he has tapped into something that is truly life-changing. The salesperson is trying to convey a sense of excitement and a sense of urgency. What he has to sell to you is super important and you've got to act now. If you don't, you'll miss out. But the classical music host is trying to chill you out, make you feel calm, slowing you down so that you can better appreciate the beauty of the music, quieting loud noises so that you can better hear. None of that is said with actual words, but all of it is said with intonation. This is what we find with coursers in the Institute. They all share a peculiar and particular intonation. They sound like robots. Why? Why would coursers adopt this particular intonation? After all, they weren't created to talk that way. Other synths don't talk that way. Synths that we find out in the Commonwealth sound like regular people. My institute designation is K198, but I prefer Jenny, so yes, I'm a synth. You're born in the wild human model 1.0. You ain't bad for that model. Not in the same league as us synths, but hey, not your fault. I think my foreman, Bill Sutton, suspects what I really am. Coursers talk the way they do to emphasize how non-human they are. You see, out in the Commonwealth, a synth wants to hide. A synth is either incognito or doesn't know that he's a synth. A synth in the Commonwealth is either programmed to be as human as possible or doesn't know any way to not act human. A courser is the exact opposite. A courser takes pride in being a synth. His roboticness is not a source of shame, it's a source of pride. It distinguishes him from all the weak humans and from all other synths. A courser is so proud of being a synth that they literally have it etched into their skin. If you look at the back of the neck of every courser, you find a tattoo etched in binary that when translated reads, synth. They are not hiding it, they're proud of it, and with their intonation, they emphasize it. They need the whole world to know that they're a synth. This way of speaking intimidates the people of the Commonwealth. People in the Commonwealth are terrified of coursers. They should be. But in the Institute, it tells the human scientists that they're subservient. I want more patrols and more rounds. Right away, sir. If you see anything even remotely suspicious, report it immediately. This absolutely cannot happen again. Got it? Yes, sir. Understood. Ransacking my quarters in the middle of the night is totally unacceptable. I'll pass along your message, doctor. See that you do. 
When a courser speaks robotically, he's admitting to his bosses that he's a subservient robot. And the robotic nature of a synth is something that the Institute really focuses on. The Institute believes that synths are tools. Of course it is far more comfortable to think of them as machines, so we can do what we want with them. They're not enslaved because they're not people. They're manufactured, they're robots, they are tools to be used by the Institute. Coursers have figured out that the best way to stay within the Institute's good graces is to act like a tool. A tool designed to kill. A tool designed to retrieve. A tool designed to obey. This peculiar courser intonation is a survival technique. Of all synths, coursers know best what happens to synths who don't comply. And that's because they themselves are used to intimidate non-conforming synths. You know you are not permitted to access terminals in that section. Is Dr. Ao mistaken? Yes. I mean, no, he's not. But I was only... What is it? Were you or weren't you accessing a terminal in SRB? I was, but I swear it's not what it sounds like. I was cleaning the terminal and it... it switched on by mistake. I was just shutting it down. Was that a stutter? Have you developed a defect, unit? Maybe you need to be reset. Sir, I assure you that won't be necessary. It won't happen again. See that it doesn't. You don't want me to tell you twice. Now get back to your duties. If you don't perform the way the Institute expects you to perform, your memory will be wiped. You will be stripped of your personality, and the Institute will roll the dice to give you a new one. No synth wants that, not even the coursers. Institute synths have figured out that they can prove their subservience to the Institute by the way they act and by the way they talk. Coursers aren't the only ones who do this. Other synths in the Institute do this as well. Janitorial and servant synths talk like this. It's an honor to have you here, sir. It must make you proud to see all that Father has done, all that he has built. I hope I'll prove a useful test subject for you, Doctor. Mm-hmm. I know you'll achieve great things here. We all do. Your presence here is a great gift, not just to Father, but to all of us. Father has done remarkable things. I would not exist were it not for him. Father is more than just our leader. He is our creator. It was a real pleasure to meet you. I'm sure you're still taking everything in, so I'll let you get back to that. What does this remind us of? It reminds us of somebody in customer service. May I help you, sir? Two Whoppers, two Whopper Juniors, and four Coca-Cola. And would I have to wait long if you made one Whopper with no pickle and no lettuce? No, sir. It's a very warm, open, and pleasant way of talking. It's designed to make you feel comfortable around them, while also assuring you that the synth is not a threatening presence. The synth is there to serve. Eve, the Institute's first personal synth, is a servant of the Benet family. The other synths in the Institute are there to serve father, are there to serve coursers, are there to serve other scientists. But when they don't think that other scientists are watching and listening, they talk like this. It doesn't feel right. Shh. Keep your voice down. You know what happens if they hear you talking like this. They'll wipe you. Gone is the overly cheery tone. Gone is the overly helpful intonation. They speak like real people. And coursers do this too. The courser we spend the most time with in the game is of course X688. We are first introduced to him while browsing Kellogg's memories. And there, he doesn't make a mistake. So, I guess you're taking the kid back with you. Affirmative. Your only mission is to locate and eliminate Virgil. We then meet him when we are sent to Libertalia. And there, he plays his role perfectly. I can handle these raiders on my own. I have no reason to doubt that, sir. But I have my orders. If you take on that synth, I'll be right there with you. All right, let's go. Right behind you, sir. And as a companion, if we ourselves act like a good representative of the Institute, X6 doesn't bat an eye. You're as tough and determined as anyone I've met. Maybe more. Anyway, that's all. Thanks for hearing me out. Now let's get back to work. 
he maintains his composure and maintains his character. But if he gets emotional, we can see him slip. This happens if we begin to do things that X6 doesn't like. If we tire him, if we annoy him, if we do things that he thinks insults the Institute, sometimes we can hear a little bit of emotion in his voice. All right, that's it. I don't care whose father you are. I can't take this anymore. You don't need to get so worked up over things. No, sir, I do. I have a feeling it's the only way I'll get through. The Institute is everything to me, and the thought of it falling apart in the hands of an incompetent leader is too painful to contemplate. So I tried to explain away the things you've done. I made excuses for you in my mind. I gave you another chance, then another. Well, I've run out of lies to tell myself. And there it is, just for a moment. He loses his robotic intonation. The way these coursers speak is a learned, cultural way of speaking. They do it in order to survive, to show the Institute what good robots they are, and to show the people of the Commonwealth how intimidating they are. I think it's fascinating that the two known ex-coursers don't talk like coursers. I think it's fascinating that when Institute synths don't think we're watching, they don't talk like Institute synths. I think what we're seeing here is the personhood of a synth. In extreme situations, in moments of fear and anxiety, in moments of anger and frustration, a synth acts more human. A synth gravitates towards acting in a way he or she was not programmed to act in a way that can only be instinctual, in a way that I think helps demonstrate that synths are not just robots. After all, if coursers were robots, they wouldn't have to act like robots. And that's what they're doing. They're acting, each and every one of them. Absolutely. I'm in the middle of producing a series on the full story of Fallout 4. I recently completed the Institute storyline. We covered absolutely everything that happens if we choose to side with the Institute. I'm in the middle of gathering footage for the next faction we'll be covering, so if you don't want to miss my next episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have already, but you still feel like you're missing out on YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I've got a brand new shirt in the shop. Explore the lore. Listen to every holotape. Read every terminal. Gather every scrap of paper. Explore the lore. This shirt design celebrates how thorough we are while scouring every game we play for every scrap of lore. My designs come on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes and in a wide array of colors. You can find them on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in another way, consider leaving a super thanks on this video. Your super thanks directly contribute to the production of this series. You could become a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. YouTube members get little badges that appear next to their names in the comment sections of my videos and access to Oxmojis that they can use in my video comments and in the live chats of my live streams. But more importantly, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.